everybody else, I invite you to turn to Deuteronomy chapter 12. That's going to be kind of our base this morning. Uh, jumping off point, can picking up where we left off last week. But last week we reread the same scripture reading twice in a row. I just think you didn't know enough about Near Eastern ancient rain patterns that you needed to hear more about it. Now, we're going to connect it all together this week, hopefully. We didn't get to it last week, had to bit off more than we could chew, but we're going to get to it this morning. This is our fourth installment on the church. We looked at first that we're united by the gospel together to Christ to physically gather. And secondly, we looked at gathering is offering worship to God, that we're not here being entertained or receiving some kind of group therapy. We're offering to God. We're presenting an offering to him that's presentable and acceptable. And then that our worship must be acceptable. Talking about a new concept called the regulative principle of worship, maybe new to us. So we looked at last week too, that the, the, the worship that, that God rejects, we gave five examples of worship that God rejects. And then we looked at what is an acceptable New Testament worship. Just thinking through singing the word, praying the word, reading the word, seeing the word in the ordinances and sacraments, and then preaching the word. Now, for some people, some of us in here, all you need to be told is that something exists in the Bible, and then that's it. You, you got it. You, that's all you need. The issue is settled for you. These are the people who see that bumper sticker on the car that says, God's word says it, I believe it, that settles it, and they go, no, and they get out of their own car with a Sharpie, and they scratch out that middle phrase, and it says, God's word says it, that settles it. I don't need to believe it. You don't need to believe anything. Whether God says it or not, that's true. We have those kind of people. Other people, we want to see a case be built for it. Why is it that way? Now, show me the, how it must be that way by some kind of logical consequence. So the, the, the first group we, that we kind of really addressed more last week, that's the people who just want to go to the gumball machine, put their money in, turn it, and get the gumball, get out and go. Second group we're going to address this morning, this is the one that goes to the big gumball machine that has the clear thing. I want to see all the tunnels, all the funnels, all the gears, all the mechanisms before I enjoy that gumball at all. I want to see it go through all of that stuff. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to divide the room into two groups. The first group, y'all sit over here. Second group, y'all, we're going to fight it out. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to appease the second group because there are good reasons to believe and to follow that the, that the regulative principle of worship comes right out of the Bible. There are good reasons to obey it as such. We have a why to look at this morning. So the verse that we're going to jump out of, which is our main verse from last week, is Deuteronomy 12, verse 32. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You shall not add to it or take from it. And we saw that repeated in Proverbs 30 and then again in Revelation 22. But this is the most succinct display of it. Everything I command you do, and you don't add and you don't subtract. Now, what we're going to look at is we're going to look at a few reasons as to why the regulative principle of worship, what this verse says, we, we do everything he says, we add nothing and we subtract nothing, why that's a blessing and a gift to us. Why is it a blessing and a gift? The first point that we're going to look at is that it unites the church in simplicity, the whole church, universal throughout time and throughout geography. Have you ever felt, at, and hopefully not here, <laughs> Have you ever felt uncomfortable in church based on what was going on up front? That, you know, that puppet show just didn't really sit well with me. Or, you know, I, that interpretive dance, that, that person needed to have on a few more clothes to do interpretive dance here in church. Or, you know, the dirt bikes were okay, but when they crashed on the stage, it just kind of threw me off. Or that movie clip, I mean, there was kids in here, and that movie's a rated R movie, and we showed that clip this morning. Or you know what, I just felt weird when the pastor and his wife were sitting on a bed together on stage and teaching from it. That's happened before, by the way. Or there's a dunk tank up there, and it's talking about our thankfulness to God. You know, I just felt weird. Or even something as simple as, there's so many pictures of Jesus, and they all look different. You got Swedish all the way over to Middle Eastern Jesus, and I, I just don't, I don't like it. I ever felt uncomfortable in church? because of those kinds of extra things. 
See, nothing but biblical mandates can be forced on the people of God. When something happens like that in church, you came to worship and you were forced to endure something else that God's word says nothing of, that you've added to. See, we all have different consciences, right? And we all have different backgrounds. We've had different experiences. And in the church, that's supposed to be respectful of those things. We see Romans 14, 13, it says, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. Well, if you're doing that in church, then we're somehow wrong. And when we add things that are not supposed to be there. We go beyond what the Word of God says, and I now have to endure it. We've all heard the horror stories of going through that. That happened at church. I came to worship, and this thing was forced on me, and I had to endure it. And that's, that's what the leadership said, that we got to go and be a part of. And you know what's sad is that most of it all comes from money. You can't do those extra weird things that make people feel uncomfortable if you don't have money. Right? Smoke machines cost money. Trapeze artists cost money. Video presentations cost money. Performing an ultrasound on stage for Right to Life Sunday costs money. Now, shouldn't we, we should be pro-life. Absolutely. 100% vociferously pro-life. But are we less faithful because we don't have the money or the resources to bring and perform an ultrasound on stage? No, we're no less faithful at all. Are we any less pro-life? No, of course not. We think about this. If what you're doing and saying this is important, we have to have this, we're giving a lot of effort, a lot of thought to this, if it can't transport geographically or chronologically, then it's unnecessary. Because is that house church in Iran meeting in secret under threat of death any less faithful than any biblical church in the Western world that can do whatever they can meet out in the open. They can put signs out in the front. They can do all of those things. Well, we'd have to say, of course not. Are, then we've got to ask, are they able to be completely biblically faithful and useful, hiding and in secret in a country like Iran? Absolutely. Is God unable to get his word out to protect his vulnerable, etc., without that money, without that ability? No, God's not bound by anything. God repeat the same kind of judgment we saw last week in Isaiah 111. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. You guys, are, you're, you have all of the money and all the resources to do this, and I hate it because of who you are, because of how you're living. The regulative principle of worship unites us in simplicity. That church is simple. And it can be exported anywhere. See, what happens most of the time when you go overseas is, is a lot of times we see foreign churches trying to emulate Western American churches, but they don't have the budget for it. And so it's really, really bad. It looks really pathetic. And sometimes they just have no budget at all and they just give up and they just start doing whatever other weird stuff that is natural to them with inside their borders adding things to worship. But the regulative principle following Deuteronomy 12, 32, it unites us in simplicity. We're just here a faithful church. All we're doing is what the Bible says to do. We're not infringing upon anybody's conscience and nothing that we do is dependent upon any level of finances. We're just as faithful as the house church in Iran, as the church in China, as the church under the mango tree in Uganda. We're just as faithful, equally as useful. And, and totally biblical in both sentences, both circumstances. You can have a faithful church if you have a Bible, some water, a jug of juice or wine, and bread. You can have a faithful New Testament church that can impact the nations, that has the exact same Great Commission as every other church in the United States. If you have those things, your church lacking in nothing. You're the exact kind of church that God wants that God commanded. It makes the faithful church, it makes faithful worship eminently exportable. We can send out what we do everywhere because it's dependent upon nothing but the scriptures. So anybody can do it anywhere that they go.
You don't have to have big, fancy, available things. So that's the first one. It unites us in simplicity. The second thing is, is that discipline is freedom. So many of hearing us about this regulative principle for the first time, we could be thinking, gosh, I just feel so restricted or stifled by this. You know, it feels like the, the strictures kind of squash freedom of expression. How, how do we deal with that? We do it like this. Discipline, biblically discipline, brings freedom and not oppression. I'm going to read you 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. It's from, this is from the NASB translation, the non-Arminian standard Bible. It says this, But have nothing to do with worldly fables fit for only old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Have you ever thought about you know, whatever it is that you're into, a- athletics, sports? Wh- what athlete is free to run a 4440? The one who is disciplined to watch what he eats, to stay in shape, to show up for workouts. That's who's free to run a 4440. What about, you ever just been blown away at a symphony by a cellist who's playing Beethoven's Fifth and you just, it just sounds like it just dripped from heaven. What cellist is free to play Beethoven's Fifth just like that? The one who is disciplined to practice, to listen, to instruction, to learn, to be at the cello all day, all the time. Have you ever looked at the, looked at the guy, I'm not naming any names, who's retired early, who's free to retire early? The one who's disciplined with their finances, budgeting things. You're free to retire early because you've disciplined. So who's, have you ever had somebody who just spews Bible, they're quoting scripture right and left. Who's free to do that? The one, the disciplined Bible memorizer. We tend to put those things off as talent. That talent is what gets you all of those things. But it's, it's discipline that brings that freedom. Absolutely unregulated activity is not freedom. What do we call that? Chaos. That's chaos. And people get hurt in chaos. One time when I was on a mission trip to Haiti, it was the first time I had ever been there, and just getting from the airport to where we were going was a handful of miles, but it took about an hour. Driving on the roads in Haiti, at first you think, this is awesome. There are no rules. There are no lines. There are no, there's no vehicle registrations. There's no uh, capacity limits. We rode in the back of a dump truck that had that, a bar welded across the top, and you just held it if you wanted to. If not, you could bounce around. You can hang off the side. There, we saw a moped that had six people on it, and they have things called tap taps because you tap tap on the roof to get out. And there are little tiny Nissan trucks that'll have 25 people in the bed, covered bed. You can, and you can drive anywhere you want. You can pass on every single side of the road. There are no rules. There's no nothing. If they want traffic to slow down, they put up a speed bump or they leave a stack of tires in the road. There are no rules. And you think, this is awesome. This is, you can do whatever you want. This is the freest country in the world. And then thinking and talking along those lines gets quickly squashed when you hear, like I did, of a collision between a moped that had four, five, six people on it and a dump truck because the, the moped was trying to get around another car. Dump truck was coming, but they're all on the wrong side of the road. There is no right or wrong side of the road, and it's just a collision. And then when you call, there is no EMT, there is no, but you're free to do whatever you want. You can help them if you wanted to, if you don't have to. So that complete unregulation is chaos, and people get hurt in chaos. Our God is not a God of disorder, but a God of order. 1 Corinthians 14, tells us, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Translated in other translations as disorder and order. See, when we know the boundaries of acceptable worship, the lines on the road, if you will, it frees our hearts and minds to have confidence before God. I can know driving around this bend that there's not going to be another car in my way because I'm in the right lane 
and oncoming traffic goes in the left lane. I have confidence because there's lines on the road and every driver has had to pass a driving test and their vehicles had to pass and inspect. It brings confidence before God. We know he will be pleased with whatever we do within the bounds of scripture, the regulative principle, Deuteronomy 12, 32. We can know that he's pleased by that. There was a study done in 2006 of all people by the American Society of Landscape Architects. I know we're all card-carrying members of that group and you've heard of them before. Nevertheless, they did a study on, on, uh, on how you landscape playgrounds and, and the fencing that goes around it and the structures and all of that. And they took a bunch of preschoolers out in this study and they took it to a playground apparatus, a beautiful brand new playground apparatus with no fence around it. And all of the kids, instinctively, they don't know they're in the study, they all stayed right near the teacher around itself. They didn't move farther from that. Then they take the same kind of kids, preschoolers, and they go to a playground apparatus that's fenced all the way around it. And the kids, no explanation, no telling them what's going on, they go all explore every square inch inside the fence. They're not tied to the teacher. They're exploring all over the place, looking around and venturing out. What does that tell us about boundaries? When there's clear boundaries, we have no fear. You don't, you're not worried innately as a kid that I could get snatched on the back. It happened to me. I could wander too far away from, from safety, from help, from hope, because there's a fence. And I know when I hit that fence, I turn around, there's my teacher right there every time. We're, we're here. We're safe. We're good. It makes sense. It's just innate to these little kids, and nobody explained it to them at all. But when we know that God desires us to draw near to him in worship, we want to be able to do that with confidence, and we're told that we can. In Hebrews 4.16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. We can't draw near to God in that confidence if we feel unsure about our acceptability. And of course, we're accepted in Christ that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And now we've been placed into Christ. But when we draw near to God in worship, what confidence do we have that he's going to receive it? If we don't know what we're doing is to be rejected or, or condemned or accepted or received. We want to live like 1 John 3, 21 through 22. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. If you're not struggling with your, in your conscience... You have confidence before God, and whatever we ask, we receive from Him because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. In the boundaries, we do what pleases Him. We have confidence. Our heart's not condemning us. We're not struggling over whether or not we should be doing this or not. Here's the lie that no boundaries brings freedom and that we have that freedom and then we can just use it. But actually what that does is it, it leads people to two extremes. It leads you either to legalism or it leads you to just a straight up free for all. So you think about the two scenarios, the, the Haitian roads and then the playground study. One was total free for all and one was legalism. Who told those kids stay right by the teacher? You know, if those kids could just kind of pop up and speak coherently for what they're feeling and thinking, they'd be like, no, 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 it's not safe anywhere else. We have to stay within at least 10 feet of the teacher. That's the only place we could be safe, legalism. Free for all is the opposite. There are no rules on the road, so I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to take curves at 50 miles an hour. I'm going to drive on all sides. I'm going to pass on all sides, and I'm going to pack as many people in my vehicle as I can. Both of them lead to not flourishing because we're either going to be legalistic or we're going to be completely antinomian. We're going to have no rules and no nothing. And people get hurt in both, right? When, we, when, we have a, when there's a church that doesn't believe the Bible or teach the Bible or understand it but still cares about morality, you become legalistic because you're not actually following these rules. You make up your own. And what you make up is always more restrictive and more oppressive than anything that God has ever said. Or you have the opposite of that. 
people who are not seeking to be governed by the word of God, they just say anything goes. And then you have churches that I know that I've heard of personally where you have people on staff sleeping with people that are not their spouses. You have rampant sin running all over the church, but money's coming in. So either way, what we need to look at and see here is that the discipline brings freedom. Think about it like a budget. Nobody likes talking about budgets, but they, they're helpful and they work. Because you think about it, the person, the person who's given to legalism, when you have a budget, they're going to go, no, 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 we never spend any money. We don't eat. We don't have electricity. We don't do anything. Because what if we overdraft? What if we bounce a check? So no, you don't need braces. You don't even need teeth. We're pulling them all out. Like we're, we're not, we might overdraft. We might bounce a check. We cannot spend any money. Legalism. But what's the other side of that? I never look at the budget at all. We're constantly overdrafting. We're constantly in debt. And then now we're oppressed by that. But if you just follow the budget and you look at the line, you go, you know what? We got 30 bucks. We can go see a movie. Huh. Free of guilt, free of concern. We just look at what the budget says. We look at the bank account. There's money there. We can do it. No guilt, no nothing. And you look at the budget. Oh, there's not money there. Huh. We'll put that for next month. The freedom that a budget brings. This is all the regulative principle is talking about on that level. That it freedom brings, or discipline brings freedom. Now thirdly, what it brings to us, the gift in a sense, is that it proves to us that God is not a distant, stoic deity. A distant, stoic deity gives us no comfort. Imagine a scenario when God gives no instruction for worship. What would that say about God? He demands to be worshipped, but he gives no instruction for that worship. Let's say he's distant, not near. He has no desire to be really known. He's harsh, and he holds high standards, but gives no direction. That's like a father that we all, as fathers, don't want to be. Or if we had, we wish that we hadn't had a father who never speaks to his kids. He's there, he's around, but he never speaks. He just gives disapproving grunts. He just sits at the table and the kids are all trembling and wondering, is dad happy? Is he, is he like me? What's going on today? It seemed to work the other day when I brought him the newspaper that... He kind of, he, the frown flattened out. It wasn't a smile, but huh, may, I'll get the paper every day then. Maybe that's what he wants. Who wants a father like that? that? That you have no idea. Just grunts and disapproval. Demands obedience and tasks well done, but gives no help. Is that a loving father? No. See, the regulative principle of worship is evidence that God is a good father father to us he is near he's not far off he's brought us in and told us who he is who we were who we are now in christ and how we enjoy the richest fellowship with him he brought us in ephesians 2 12 and 13 says remember paul says to these ephesian brothers and sisters that you were at that time separated from christ alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise, which leads you to be this, those who have no hope, who are without God in the world. That's who you were. You're outside the house, not in with the family. But now, verse 13, in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ brings you near and says this is how it goes in our house i've adopted you into my family and i'm not just saying hey figure it out there's chores to do there's things that are going on there's also good stuff that you could be a part of but i'm not telling you anything he's a father he's there he's like hey i know you're new this is how we do it this is how we do dinner this is how we do chores this is which bed you sleep in this is when we go and this is when we come this is how we drive this is how we ride the car He's telling us all of these things brought into this new family because he's a good, near, loving father. We have comfort in that. And then here's our last big point. There's more underneath it. I hear what you're saying, pastor. 
I get it. That all kind of makes a lot of sense. But just the, but don't we want the church to grow? I mean, all of this stuff. I mean, it sounds. Isn't it going to kill the church growing? I mean, we want more people to come. And it sounds like what you're saying is like, if you're just as boring as all get out, then that'll be faithful to God. <laughs> we want the church to grow, though. I'm glad you asked. Let's, let's think about just diagnosing our own hearts for why we want the church to grow. Why? Is it for the glory of God, for the salvation of souls, for the equipping of the saints? It has to be those things. It can't be because we want brand recognition fame, influence, or, or, or we want to out-compete somebody else. My friends go to that church, and <laughs> their pastor's fatter than our pastor. And we should just come over here. We have a better-looking pastor. I mean, we, we would, we would we, we're, we're, we're funnier. We're better. Well, competition. I mean, or, or just to know that we're a part of something successful. It just could be pride. We want to be successful and known as successful to tell people at the playground or at Little League or at Sewing Circle or at golf uh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, we got like 5,000 people coming, and we add about 5,000 a day. <laughs> I don't know what we're doing, but I guess it worked anyway. Just pride. Is that why? Because if it's not for the glory of God, the salvation of souls, and the equipping of the saints, then we have the wrong motives for wanting the church to grow. But if those are our motives, then we still got to think, well, yeah, those are my motives. That, that's, what I, that's why we want it to grow. Let's ask this other diagnostic question to our own souls. Who do we think grows the church? Matthew 16, verse 18, and Jesus just tells us, And I tell you, you are Peter. This is after Peter makes the great profession that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, you actually nailed it, Peter. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Who will build Christ's church? Christ will build his church. He told us. So when we think about it, I, I uh, was listening to an old interview with John MacArthur when he was in, in the 70s. So back with wide ties and long lapels. The gospel still went out in those times. Some of y'all lived through that. You know. <laughs> wide ties, long lapels. And this interviewer, this reporter for a Christian uh, paper, there weren't blogs or anything back then, says, so, so what do you want to do to build the church? And he said, let me stop you right there. I don't want to ever compete with Jesus. And he said he's going to build the church, and I don't want to get into his business. Christ builds the church. So this is what we got to deal with, with this issue. This is what it all kind of coalesces to, and we're finally going to get to that Deuteronomy 11 passage. There's a phantom that floats around churches, mostly here in the West, but it gets exported overseas. This phantom floats around, whispers into ears, giving instructions, and it's in meetings, particularly about budget items or planning meetings in different ministries or even up in the elders and the deacons, and it's influencing things, and it has to die. This phantom has got to die. It's the phantom called pragmatism. It has got to to die. Otherwise, we cannot be a faithful church. Let me read you this passage that we've already read once. People are going out uh, of Egypt in, in the Pentateuch, and their, their, their backs are to the promised land, or Moses' back is to the promised land. He's talking to the people on the plains of Moab, re-instructing them, re-establishing them so that they can now go in to the promised land. And he says this, "'You shall therefore keep the whole commandment that I command you today, that you may be strong. So if you don't keep the commandments, you're not going to be strong. Go in and take possession of the land that you are going over to possess, that you may live long in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers to give them and their offspring, a land flowing with milk and honey. This is the land that God swore to give, the promised land. And here's our first thing. For the land that you are entering to take possession of, it is not like the land of Egypt. From which you have come, where you sowed your seed and irrigated it like a garden of vegetables. You're going into a land that's not like where you were before. Pragmatism rules in the land of slavery. 
See, Egypt is flat, and that's where the Nile dumps out. It's the biggest river that runs south to north on the globe. I don't know how it does it, but that's what it does. And then the delta spreads out as it dumps into the Mediterranean Sea there in Egypt. There's always water because if it rains in the Congo, then there's lush greenery in Egypt. And they irrigate the land. That's what they do. They, you, it's not going to be like this, though, in Israel. You're going to live by something totally different. But the land you are going over to possess is a land of hills and valleys, which drinks water by the rain from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are always upon it from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. See, pagans live by the mottos, you make your own luck. I'm the master of my own fate. Nose to the grindstone. That's what pagans live by. That's how pagans grow their businesses by the customer is always right. I don't know about you, but I'm getting pretty tired of going in and reading signs in stores that are just straight up lies. What do the signs say? Your safety is our number one priority. And all the COVID stuff, they all have that. And I just want to scratch it out and go, no, it's not. Making money is your number one priority. If you thought that taking all of this stuff down would make you more money, then you would do it. But you're doing all of this because you want to make money. The customer's always right. All I have to do is tell them what they want to hear, and then they'll come and give me all their money. So if I tell them how your safety, I thought people across the street, I can't really vouch for them. It's been your safety. But we, on the other hand, take your safety very seriously. So seriously, it's number one priority that we have. No, it's not. The bottom line is your number one priority. Lining pockets is your number one priority. That's how businesses function. We're not mad at them for that. That's what they do. Just tired of being lied to. But this is not how God commands his people to function. Those are very pragmatic signs to see. Great for business. Horrible for church. We do extremely unpragmatic things to the glory of God. On purpose. Because we live in a land of hills and valleys. We don't live in a flat land that has river. God commands his people to do unpragmatic things. So what you're going to say to draw people into your organization, you're going to have one guy get up and babble on for 40 minutes? That's going to bring them in? You're going to have musicians up here who are not classically trained? And you're not going to have the volume up so loud that nobody can hear themselves think? <laughs> you guys are idiots. <laughs> what are you doing? Nobody's going to come see that. Why would you be a part of that? You're going to have the kids, and you're going to teach them from an ancient book that's several millennia old? You think that's going to keep kids' attention? You think that's going to like make them love it? Incredibly unpragmatic. Wait, wait. So you're going you're gonna to stand up and take public positions against the zeitgeist of the culture? You're going to tell everybody that they're living incorrectly and what they're doing is displeasing to God? That's very unpragmatic. Nobody's going to like that. That's not going to work. You stand against cultural ties? We do unpragmatic things to the glory of God. The redeemed people of God, we're freed from the tyranny of pragmatism, of just do whatever works. See, if you don't do that in Egypt, then you don't have any food. If you don't dig irrigation ditches, and some sources that I read this week even said that there were, there were reservoirs that they would dig and fill up and then found a way to pump water out of them, then you are in the desert, right? That is what Egypt is. So if you don't pragmatically do whatever works with the river delta that you have, then you don't survive. It's a flat country, and there's not any rain. It rains in the Congo, and the river runs up Africa to Egypt. But we don't live there. We live in a place of hills and valleys that says, what about God? It says that God is watering it by the rains from heaven, a land that the Lord your God cares for in a way that he doesn't for Egypt. He's providing for you. So you don't live by reach the goal no matter what it takes. Set goals and reach them. That's not how we live in the promised land. God provides in the land of promise. How would their crops get watered? 
God would send rain and it would flow by the contours of the land. So no more digging trenches for irrigation. You just complete dependence upon the providence of God. See, what we think sometimes is, yes, we can depend on God, but we can also irrigate and dig trenches. And we can you know, get all those things. Well, we, we know how to do that. We, we, we remember that from the land of slavery. We, we can still do those things. But we, so we think it in the church, well, we need, we need marketers. We need entrepreneurs. We need type A leaders. See, that's what we need. No, we just till and sow and tend and wait for rain. Like Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 7. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Who are these people? They don't matter. Servants through whom you believe. That's all they are. They're just servants. As the Lord assigned to each, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. See, the people don't make anything happen. God makes everything happen. You can plant and you can water, and it won't do any good if God doesn't make that thing germinate and grow. See, our vitality as the people of God, wanting to see the church grow, following the regulative principle, is not dependent upon our own ingenuity. Have you ever felt like a failure because the church that you were a part of didn't grow based on some spectrum or some metrics forced upon it? It's your fault. You weren't charming enough. You didn't have en enough canvassing done. You, you didn't sing better. You didn't recruit enough musicians. Or maybe sometimes you got to pay some unbelievers to sing the songs because they're better than us. We failed because the church didn't grow. But what does the scripture say? He who plants and he who waters is not anything. God gives the growth. So it's not us. See, the regulative principle frees us from that. God sends rain when and where he desires. But do we work? Yes, we work. We, we don't sit back and do nothing. That's not, the, that's not the right response. Pastors and elders are commanded to work. 2 Timothy 2.15 do your best to present yourself to God as one approved or be diligent, the NASB says. Be diligent to present yourself to God approved as a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. So what do we do then? The ordinary things that God has told us to do, which is preach the word, the ministry of the word, the ministry of the sacraments, so the Lord's Supper and baptism and prayer. We do those things faithfully. And then you think when you're in the promised land, but it's just, I'm not seeing water running through the ditches. And you're like, yeah, you're not, you're not gonna until it rains. And God waters the mountains the same way he waters the valleys. If it rains, he brings the growth. Think about this. When the Israelites enter the land, the promised land with Joshua, and Joshua chapters 13 through 19, he divides up the land. So you're going into this land where God says, don't do any irrigation. Don't do that. Because what, what did he say? What was the reason why? Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Other things, other means are going to bring this about. We're going to be deceived by that. And then you think, well, we didn't even get to choose where we live in this land. God chose that. So he put the tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim over here. He put Levi over here. He put uh, Naphtali and Dan and Gad over here. He put Benjamin there. He put Judah there, Reuben there, Simeon there. And, and nobody got to pick. Some people have valleys. Some people have mountains. Some people are flat. What are you waiting on? What is everybody relying on? God causing the growth. Now, if you're in the mountains, can you expect the same kind of growth as the valleys? No, but isn't God's rain falling on you equivalently? Yes. So we can all say God is providing for all of us, and we have different crop yields in different places. So the same is true for churches. Different, different sizes. According to God's sovereignty, God chose where it rained and who he put where. All you can do is all you can do. You trust God for the, for the growth. He brings it. And the final nail in the coffin is this, is that faithfulness is the only command. 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through 2, 
This is how one should regard us. Paul's saying, you want to know how to think about us? As, you know, as the apostles, as these missionaries, this is how you think about us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And there's one thing required of servants of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. That's what's required. So he's like, don't, don't turn back to the faithless ways of Egyptian slavery where you made your own luck and, you, and you, you, your pluck got you out. And when you had water and you had crops, you could look at yourself and say, I dug the trench years into this. I have growth. I have food more than you. He said, don't do that. That's faithlessness. Trust God completely. You handle the faithfulness. God handles the fruitfulness. I'll never forget that. My dad told me that when I was 23 years old, leading the first Bible study I was ever totally on my own. As an adult, I'm married, leading these college freshman guys in a Bible study. And I call my dad after like the third or fourth meeting that we had that semester. And I'm like, Dad, I just can't get these guys to do anything. I mean, it, it, when they show up, they don't say anything. They don't talk. They, they, don't, they don't do the Bible study beforehand. They didn't even read the passage beforehand then when we get there i throw out questions and they just look at me they don't say anything <laughs> or they'll just be like yeah i just didn't i didn't get around to it this week and i was like well what'd you do every night oh man i was playing world of warcraft i was playing halo and i'm like dad they're just playing video games i'm just going on and on and on and on to my dad about how pathetic these guys are in my bible study my dad just lets me just spin my wheels all the way out and then he says you provide the faithfulness God provides the fruitfulness. That's all you do. He determines the growth. So you show up every week. You pray for those guys. You keep pursuing them. You keep asking them questions, engaging them in these things, bringing them back to the scriptures. But you cannot make them do anything. Only God can do that. So stop trying to do God's job. It's a good conversation with my dad. I'll never forget it. So here as we wrap up, the regular principle, what it does is it's an amazing gift at the end of the day. Here's what it gives us. We get to get to the end of our lives as those who are affiliated with members of, leaders of Faith Bible Church, following Deuteronomy 12.32, and we can know that whatever it is that we are, whatever it is that we became, Christ did it. We're not going to have to look back and go, yeah. Did we cut corners and we start mixing in some goats with the sheep? Do we manipulate things and start planting in tares with the wheat just to make the field more, be filled out more? And eventually the wheat will take over. Did, did we do that? Is Faith Bible Church some monument to human ingenuity? Or is it a testimony to the goodness of God and the faithfulness of Christ to save those whom he knows through his gospel, we're freed from having to worry about that. We can claim 1 Corinthians 4, 3, that stewards must be found faithful. We, we did that. Whether we had the one talent, the two talents, or the five talents, he gave us that. We were faithful with what we had. We won't have to worry. If we fabricated an organization, we could be confident that Christ built his church among us. No manipulation. We know there's plenty of other groups out there calling themselves churches that man has built. And they will crumble. But we can be, be sure at the end of our lives that Christ did it by following these principles. And at the end, if that's our story, who will receive all the glory? It can only be Christ. It can't be us. It's not going to be a statue of me anywhere or the elders or, or, or the members or anything. There's not going to be a nameplate put up for all of these people. It'll be Christ. That's who we exist to glorify. Who will receive the glory? Not you, not me, certainly not Scott. <laughs> it will be Christ who receives all the glory. We'll be able to say like Luther did at the end of his life where he's now led this Protestant Reformation and somebody comes and asks him and says, Martin, what did you do to make this thing happen? This global revolution. 
and the eyes of everybody being open to the lies of the church, and now you have the gospel going out, people being saved. How did you do it? He said, I didn't do anything. I sat in Wittenberg at the pub with Melanchthon, and the word of God did everything. I did nothing. The word did everything. Meaning, I, I, didn't, I didn't strive and strain. All I did was put forth the word of God, and it did it all. That's what our hope is. So the Egyptians, they may look at us and say, say, you don't have any river at all to water your land. And we can say, well, we don't want the river. We have clouds above that God rains down on us. So we're content for the ground to look a little dry and for it to look not as productive as yours does 24-7 because God rains down down on us and his eye is on our land all year long for the growing season from the beginning to the end he takes care of us our boast our hope our confidence and our joy is christ that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep he is the good shepherd who goes and calls out his own and brings them into his flock he will sustain all who repent of sin and trust in him so all we do is we just follow his word. And that gives us all the freedom and all the joy and all the blessing that he intends. He sends the rain and we just praise him for it. Father in heaven, thank you for freeing us from the burden of doing a Godward activity of building your people. We can't do it. We can do a lot of things that could draw a lot of people. If we had money, we could do endless things. If we had no shame or no dignity, no faith, we could do endless things that could fill any number of buildings. And we've seen men come and go who've done that many times. But we want to get to the end of our races and be able to stand before you and know that whatever it is you made us into, that was your design. You caused that growth. That none of our value, none of our worth is in whether or not we are on charts in our association of the fastest growing churches in the region. None of our value and none of our worth is hitting metrics that say you got to be this when the church is X amount of years old. None of our value and worth is in anything our worth is not even what we own or what we contrive or manipulate or fabricate. Our worth is in Christ. And no matter what, we'll be found faithful. Whether you've called us to, to farm dry, rocky soil that you'll send rain to, but it's not the most inhabitable land for massive growth. Maybe you will call us to one day be in a valley that pools up all the water. We have lots of things to deal with, lots of people to love and to serve, lots of souls to see saved. We would praise you for that. But Father, may our, our schematic for success not be anything but your own word. May we be free because we follow your word and the principles that are laid down. May we be unified in simplicity with our brothers and sisters in churches all over the globe and throughout all of history. May we be grateful that you are near to us, that you speak to us and you explain to us how and what we are to do and when and to do it, and that we can be enthralled that you cause the growth. We certainly don't want to do anything to inhibit your work, but as we strive in faithfulness, that who you bring here, how you bless them and sanctify them here, that that is your work and not ours. That we'll get to the end of our, our days, we'll be tired, we'll have sweaty brows, bloody lips, tear-filled eyes, because it'll feel like we did a whole lot, but then when we stand before you, we'll know that we did, we didn't do anything. You did it all. That we may have watered, some of us may have planted, different times but you cause all the growth and you 
receive all the glory. And that's all we want to be in the business of, is you getting glory. So use us towards those ends, and we thank you for eternity, that you being glorified necessarily has the outworking of us being edified, built up, encouraged, and loved. So we thank you. And we thank you, and we thank you. In Christ's name, amen.